Please turn with me to the Word of God, to Exodus chapter 11. Exodus chapter 11. I was thinking as I, I look here among us and I thought, you know, people are, of this area, they don't think anything of us. We're, we're, we're just nobodies. But I want you to see these people were nobody. They were slaves. But what God says about these people. Verse 3, 11, 3. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord. That's why we're here. We want to hear what the Lord's going to say. That's, that's it. I don't care about my opinions. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the beast. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. The Lord's telling them, now, and this is what these nobodies, what I'm going to do. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue, against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference. Not make a difference. He puts a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. I was looking at that word different differences. It's in the Bible almost 20 times. And every time the Lord talks about different difference, he talks about the clean from the unclean. And that's what this is. This is God's people. And you know in Corinthians there, Paul tells the Corinthians, who, not what, who make thee to differ? What do you have that you have not received? And if you received it, why are you boasting about it? God has put the difference. That difference is the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't look any different. We don't act much different. But God has put a difference between his people. and the people Between law and grace, works and grace, saved and unsaved, gospel and religion. And oh, how blessed we are. How blessed we are. I pray we don't ever take it for granted. Let us go to the Lord in prayer, please. Lord, you're, we've gathered today and we take great comfort in knowing that you have said where two or more gathered, you will be, that you are present in this very room with us this day. And we confess to you, Lord, that we believe and you give us that faith to believe that you alone have all power. We have none. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us the power this morning to hear, to believe, to worship you, to exalt you. We ask your hand upon your prophets whom you brought out for the preaching of your gospel. Lord, that you may put into their mouths and hearts what you once said. And that you enable them by your spirit to declare Christ and him crucified. And to do it simply, truthfully, and boldly, not holding anything back. And as your people, Lord, give us the faith this day to believe it. Not only to hear it, but to love it. And the wisdom to defend it. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God of mercy and goodness. And that your mercy and goodness never ceases to your people. 
that we are undeserving sinners and that we, Lord, are completely dependent on you for all, all things. We especially rejoice today that we have the great blessing of witnessing your saving hand upon those who were in unbelief and you've come to them, made them willing and give them the faith to come to Christ. Give us that faith also, Lord, to believe on and in you and that all glory would go to you. Amen. Let's all stand together again and we'll sing hymn number 58 in your hardback hymnal, 58. <clears throat> together to Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, <clears throat> today is a very special day in our family and uh, for our church family in that Ryan and Lord Grace have both asked me to baptize them. And uh, they will be professing faith in Christ at the conclusion of this service, of which we're all very, very thankful. Um, and um, I guess I've sort of prepared this message for them, but you're welcome to listen in. Um, <clears throat> you know the events that take place in Acts chapter 8 is when Philip is sent of God to meet the Ethiopian eunuch in Gaza and the question that the eunuch asks 
Philip after having heard the gospel is the question for us this morning. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And I've titled this message, All Hindrances Removed. Because the truth is, there's only one hindrance. And Philip answered that question when he answered the Ethiopian with a question. You remember what Philip said? If thou believest, all thine heart thou mayest. And what did that Ethiopian say? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You see, unbelief is the only hindrance to confessing Christ in baptism. Only one. One. No other. Men will put lots of other barriers in the way. And in our own minds and in our own imaginations, we will build up things that, that hinder us that hinder us. I hope this morning that the Lord will remove those hindrances, that we will not forbid him. Uh, you remember when the Lord, when the Lord, the, the, there was some small children around the Lord and, and the disciples pushed them out of the way. And what did the Lord say to the disciples? Forbid them not to come unto me. That word forbid is the same word translated in our text in Acts 8 where um, the Ethiopian said, what doth hinder me? What forbids me? What keeps me from Christ? When our Lord rebuked the Pharisees, the scripture says, and the lawyers were rebuked because they hindered men from coming to Christ. The lawyers were presenting the law as a necessary means in order for someone to come. And so they hindered men from coming by presenting themselves as the gatekeepers of the law and the examples of righteousness. And the Lord rebuked them because they hindered men from coming to Christ. What doth hinder me? In Acts chapter 10, when Peter was sent of God to Caesarea to preach the gospel to Cornelius, the first Gentile convert, and after he preached the gospel to them and there was a demonstration of the Spirit of God poured out upon them, Peter looked at him around and he said, Can any man forbid or hinder these from being baptized? And the answer was no. <laughs> No, we can't forbid it. No, we can't hinder it. <clears throat> I want to preach the gospel in such a way all the time so that the only thing that would hinder someone from being saved is their own unbelief. I pray that the Lord would enable us to be like those who prepared the way for the king. John referred to that, John the Baptist, when in, in John chapter 1, when he said, uh, well, he quoted, turn with me to Isaiah 40, because that's where he's quoting from. John the Baptist, as the forerunner of Christ, as the forerunner of Christ, quotes Isaiah 40, as the prophecy that he was to fulfill. And so in Isaiah chapter 40, beginning at verse 3, and the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. That's what John said, I'm the voice. I'm but a voice that crieth in the wilderness. 
Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked places made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now here's the, here's the analogy. The king is coming. And so men were to go out and remove all the obstacles that were in the way for the entourage of the king. If there were stones in the road, trees fallen over, crooked places that needed to be made straight, holes that needed to be filled up, all of that was to be done so that there would not be any hindrance for the coming of the king. And John said, that's, that's my call from God, to remove the hindrances. <laughs> the, we know that the, the cities of refuge where the manslayer uh, was, to, was to run to to, perfect, to protect himself from the avenger of blood, the cities of refuge, there were signs out pointing to the cities of refuge and the people that lived in those areas were to make sure that the roads were clear, that any one who had the law chasing them could get clearly and plainly without obstacles to the city of refuge and find safety. That's how we ought to preach and that's how we ought to think. Lord, remove the obstacles. The, the Ethiopian eunuch saying to Philip, if I've heard you correctly, then even though I'm, I'm an Ethiopian, <laughs> I'm not an Israelite, I'm not a Jew, what doth hinder me from professing Christ? The sick, the lame, the poor, and the needy cannot be hindered. Matter of fact, those things are not a hindrance. They are the qualifications for being baptized. To see that you are nothing in your salvation and that he is everything that you made no contribution to your salvation, that he made it all, and he made it all by himself. Lord, if, you're, if, if, one of the, if one of the requirements for me to profess faith in Christ in baptism is that I have to do something, have I done it right? Have I done it, have I done it often enough? Did I do enough of it? What doth hinder me to be baptized if thou believest? Now notice in our story in, in, in Acts chapter 8 that in verse 26, the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza. Yes, the same place that we see in the news today. That strip of Desert land south of Jerusalem, always been called Gaza. And Gaza, by interpretation, means a fortified stronghold. A fortified stronghold. So, what are the obstacles that men put in the way? What are the hindrances that men uh, suggest that have to be uh, that have to be accomplished in order for one to profess faith in Christ. They add to the simplicity of faith by saying, well, you know, you need to clean up your life. You need to, you need to, to break the bondage of sin. You, you live in the fortified stronghold of Gaza. And uh, until you find a way to, uh, to change 
the bondage of your sin, you can't be saved. Well, what a, what a hindrance that is. Truth is, when the Spirit of God causes you to see that you're a sinner, you come to the conclusion that everything about you is sinful. And that, that, that you're not capable of producing anything that's without sin. That you need a Savior who himself is holy and harmless and separate from sinners and higher than the heavens. <laughs> One who can, can present himself and his righteousness on your behalf. That the Lord sent Philip down to Gaza. So here's the question. Do you live in Gaza? A fortified stronghold of sin and unbelief? I cannot change my nature. I need a new nature. I need a sinless nature. The Lord Jesus Christ came to preach deliverance to the captives. There was no way this Ethiopian eunuch could have been delivered apart from having the Lord Jesus Christ to stand in his stead before God and present his righteousness on his behalf. And there's you, you see, you and I live in Gaza. That's where sinners are. He came to set the prisoner free. <laughs> you see, sin is like leprosy. It's in the blood. And it affects every part of us. The woman with the issue of blood said, Oh, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, <laughs> I could be made whole. It wasn't, it wasn't her hand that made her whole. It was his garment that made her whole. And so it is with faith. It's not our faith that makes us whole. It's the object of that faith that cleanses us and puts away all our sin before God. Gives us a righteousness outside of ourselves that we could never have. And notice, notice in our text that the Lord told Philip to go down to Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Desert. <laughs> That's where we live. We, we live in a desert, a dry and thirsty land, a place where there is no life. <clears throat> We've been living in a land without water and without bread. You remember in 2 Samuel chapter 9 when when David, after now Saul has died and David has established his kingdom and David calls in his servant Ziba and says to Ziba, he says, is there anyone left from the household of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? David loved Jonathan. He wanted to demonstrate the kindness of the king toward a a descendant of Jonathan. And Ziba said, yes, there is a young man. His name is Mephibosheth. He's crippled in both his feet, can't walk. And he lives in Machir. And Machir translated means sold. He's been sold into sin by his father. And he lives, and that city of Machir is in the country of Lodabar. And Lodabar translated means not a pasture. It's, it's this little city down in the desert. <laughs> That's where Mephibosheth is. And David said, fetch him. Go get him. Bring him to me. Here's what the Lord is telling Philip to do. Go down into Gaza. That fortified stronghold. You know, I was thinking, we, we see in the Gaza of our own hearts what we are observing in the news today. There is a, a web of tunnels that, 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 that hold evil in our hearts that, that, that we, can't, we can't eradicate. <laughs> 
can't fix the problem. We need a Savior. Here's, you see, sin is not an obstacle for professing faith in Christ. It is the very qualification. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You're not a sinner. If you don't have, if you don't have the darkened tunnels of evil in your heart and you, and you, and you don't live in Gaza and you're not, you're not left in a, in a desert land to yourself, that's where the Lord sends his preachers with the gospel that has no hindrance, has no hindrance. And notice in verse 27, and he arose and went and behold a man of Ethiopia. Ethiopia, symbolizing the spiritual darkness of this man. He lived in a land where there was no light. And the scripture tells us that in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, was life. And the life was the light of men. And light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They will not come to the light that they might have life. Lord, I'm an Ethiopian by nature. I live in a dark pagan land. Left to myself, there'd be no bread and no water. I'd be in complete, in complete bondage to my sin. This Ethiopian had been brought by God in prevenient grace. Now, prevenient grace is the work of God in the hearts and lives of his elect before he calls them out of darkness into his marvelous light. It is the providential circumstances of God that causes them to be put in the place to where the Lord will now save them. And in God's prevenient grace, this Ethiopian chosen of God had come to this conclusion. All the religions of Ethiopia will not do me. I have a need that they can't meet. Ethiopia was a, a very, a very uh, well populated country with lots of folks that were engaged in the religions of Ethiopia and completely satisfied with the, with the, the, the hope that those religions gave them, but not this eunuch, not this eunuch. God had begun working in his heart, and he had heard about a God, a God by the name of Jehovah, the God of the Jews. And so he had traveled with his entourage all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem, to worship the God of Jerusalem. And now he's left Jerusalem and headed back to Ethiopia and he still hasn't worshiped God. The, religions of the, the religion of the Jews had not helped him any more than the religions of Ethiopia. Why? Because there were hindrances in those religions that he could not meet. There were qualifications in that religion that, that he could not satisfy. And so now, after hearing the gospel, he says to Philip, what doth hinder me to be baptized? If I've heard you correctly, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who are you are declaring as the Messiah, has put away all those hindrances that men say are required in order for me to be saved. Is there anything now that hinders me? That's all I've met with all my life is hindrances. And God has spared me and he's prevented me from, from finding hope and comfort 
in man-made, free will, works religions. Religions that require something of me. Any message of salvation, any message of salvation that requires you to do anything in order for God to be able to save you is a works religion. And it's a hindrance. And if the Lord in his mercy and grace has given you any light, any hope, any understanding, you know that you can't satisfy the demands of those religions. That's why, that's why man-made religion is so hypocritical, isn't it? Everybody trying to prove to one another that they've, they've made the grade They've met the standard. <clears throat> and notice he's a eunuch. An emasculated man, unable to have children, unable to produce life, impotent, without power in himself. Here's the question for you and for me. God find us in Gaza, a fortified stronghold of sin that we cannot break, that we cannot deliver ourselves from, a desert where there's no bread and no water. From the land of Ethiopia, spiritual darkness and no hope. Notice also that this Ethiopian, verse 27, and he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of Ethiopia. Now, Candace is a, is a, a dynasty, not an individual person. So Candace is representative of the ruler of Ethiopia. Kind of like Pharaoh would, was not a person, it was a dynasty. Uh, so this Ethiopian eunuch now, he, he, is, he has authority over the treasury, not of an individual person, but of the nation, of the kingdom of Ethiopia. I can only imagine what his chariot would look like. Now only imagine the entourage that he had and the clothes that he was wearing as compared to this bedouin by the name of Philip. Philip's not even, this isn't even Philip the disciple. This is Philip the deacon, one of the seven that was chosen in Acts chapter 7 to, be, to, to distribute the food among the, among the, the, the disciples in Jerusalem. So you can see the contrast between these two individuals. And here comes Philip up to this great man of Ethiopia. And not only did the religions of Ethiopia not meet his need, not only did the works religion of Judaism not meet his need, but he had no lack of wealth and all the possessions of this world did not satisfy the need of his soul. You see, if a, man can be, if a man can be content with what this world has to offer, then, then God's not doing a work of grace in the heart. I don't know any other way to put that. If a man can be content with all the wealth and riches and, and, and provisions and, and comforts of this world and not find a need in his soul for something more. All the religions of this world, not find a need. For God's, not working, God's not doing a work of grace for him. But if all these things leave you wanting, leave you lacking... And all the, the hindrances that men put in the way in order for you to be saved, 
you find that you can't meet them, there's hope. There's hope. He left Jerusalem with a copy of the scriptures. <laughs> I love that. That's all he had. His, his power, his possessions, his religions of his own country and the works religion of Judaism, none of it met the need that God was putting in his heart. Was he... Now, the scripture says no man seeketh after God at any time. Was he seeking God? Is that why God is now rewarding him? No. No, God's seeking him. God, uh, Michael, you read it. God had made him to differ. God had caused him so that he could not find satisfaction in these things. And he would not be satisfied until God revealed himself to him. So God's seeking him. All he's got is a copy of God's word. <laughs> oh, he, he found no comfort in, uh, in the ceremonies of Judaism. But he left with a copy of God's word. So precious and so valuable you know prior to the printing press is that 14 something a bible would cost you an entire year's wages to have and now we let them collect dust and sit around <laughs> oh what a We've got God's word. He had God's word. Ain't no telling what he paid for that back then. And we don't know how much of it he had, but we know he had the book of Isaiah. And he's reading from the book of Isaiah. All you and I have, all we need is a word from God. That's all we need. Opinions, thoughts, confessions, creeds, <laughs> the words of men, oh, they will all fall short in removing the hindrances. No, those things will become a hindrance. If we, we rely upon the opinions of men and the works of men and the words of men. Those things will become a hindrance to us. Paul asked this question twice. He asked it once in Galatians and once in the book of Romans. He said the very simple question. What saith the scriptures? It settles all controversy. For those who, who've been brought to believe. Those who know that God of his own will begats he us. With the word of truth. <laughs> With the word of truth. What, what's God say? That's all I want to know. Faith. Saving faith. Comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of God, doesn't it? God promises to bless his word. If God's going to speak to our hearts, it will be by his word. Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Thy word, David said, is a lamp unto my feet. Thy word is a light unto my path. In the breaking of bread, the disciples' eyes were opened and they beheld Christ. <laughs> oh, we open God's word to reveal the glorious person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, another hindrance that the Lord removed from this Ethiopian 
He put him in Gaza, raised him up in Ethiopia, gave him a position of power and wealth, let him go to Jerusalem, gave him a copy of scripture, but he can't understand the scriptures. All he can do is read them. <laughs> Philip comes along beside his, his uh, chariot and says to him, Understand this what thou readest? And God gave that Ethiopian eunuch the humility to say, No, I don't. How can I except a man should guide me? Oh, most men in his power and his position, seeing this, this man who was nowhere near the status of him, <laughs> would have raised their eyebrows and their nose to the air and said, who do you think you are? They would have said, like the Jews said in John chapter 9, when that Lord healed that blind man that was born blind, and, uh, and the blind man rebukes the Pharisees, he says to them, no man could do this unless God was with him. And the Pharisees in indignation, incensed with, 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 with this, this blind man, they said, you were born, are you coming to teach us? <laughs> oh, isn't it wonderful how the Lord takes just a, a sinner, uses him. The Lord said, to the disciples, he said, go ye into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. you know, God, God raises up men. Generally speaking, they have less ability and less intellect <laughs> and le than, than, the, than the average person. And yet, what's the Lord doing? He's He's humbling his people to be taught by another. How can I accept God? David, strong David, had to have Nathan come to him and teach him. Naaman, oh, the commander in chief of the army of, 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 uh, of, of the strongest nation in the world comes down to Nothan, Dothan and, and meets Elijah. <laughs> and he's got to be taught of Elijah, the prophet. God sends Andrew to fetch Simon and sends Philip to fetch Nathaniel and set, sends Paul to fetch Saul and uh, 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 Lydia and, and Peter to fetch Cornelius. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. How shall they believe on him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? God gives a teachable spirit to his children when he calls them. So that they're able to say with this Ethiopian, tell me what God says. I need to know. You know, the Lord's called you to spend your time studying God's word. Tell me what it says. And just tell me what God says. That's all I want to know. Don't give me your opinion. Don't tell me fun, entertaining stories. Tell me about Christ. I'm teachable. God's made me so. And we're not that way by nature. We're not that way by nature. We, we, we're not teachable. <laughs> we don't ask questions. We're proud, self-righteous, and independent. The Lord removed the hindrance of being left to himself. And he removed the hindrance of pride by making him humble and teachable. What a blessing it is. God gives a teachable spirit. Even when, even when we are rebuked. I, I, when uh, David is now 
had his throne taken from him by his very own son, and he's fleeing from Jerusalem, Absalom. And, uh, and there's a man by the name of Shimei, and Shimei is throwing stones at David and cursing David. And David's, remember if it was, it was Abner, no, I think it was one of his other commanders, said to David, who is this dog that speaks this way to the king? Let me go and take his head off. <laughs> and what did David say? David said, leave him alone. The Lord sent him. The Lord sent him to curse me. The Lord sent him to correct me. The Lord sent him to rebuke me. What a blessing it is. God enables us to be corrected and rebuked and taught. This is where this, this, is where this Ethiopian is. How can I except a man should guide me? Come up here. Tell me what this is. And then he asks him, he says, he's reading from Isaiah 53. And the Ethiopian, let's, let's go back to our text. In verse 29, then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, how can I? except some man should come, should guide me. And he desired, he pleaded with Philip. He didn't say, yeah, I'll give you permission to get in my chariot with me. He begged him to come up there. Would you, do, do you understand anything in the scriptures? Could you come up here and tell me what this means? In the place of the scripture which he's read, verse 32, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb dumb before his shears, so he opened not his mouth. And in his humiliation and in his judgment, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip. Now the word answered there, it's an old English way. He's asking. He wasn't answering anything. He wasn't get. He was asking him. The Philip, and he asked him. He said, uh, "I pray thee, I plead with thee, I beg thee. Do you do you have any idea who these who this prophet's talking about? Is he talking about himself, or is he talking about another?" And Philip, beginning at that very text preached unto him Jesus. And I could just imagine Philip beginning his message from this text by saying, well, you just left Jerusalem. It's only been a short while since Christ was crucified. Uh, you were with the rabbis and with the religious leaders of the city. Did they tell you anything about, did you hear any talk about Jesus of Nazareth that was crucified by the Romans? Just a little while ago? Oh yeah, I did hear them talking about him. But they, but they excused it as if he was no one special. He was nothing but a rabble rouser. He was a, he, he was a, he, he was a blasphemer. He, he said that he was God. Now I can hear Philip. You just asked me who Isaiah is talking about. That's who he's talking about. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. He's the one. He's the one who in his humiliation, his judgment was taken from him. In other words, he's the one who bore all the sins of God's people, the one who, who himself was without sin, who himself was judged holy and righteous before God, but as our sin bearer, as our sin bearer, his judgment was taken away in his humiliation. And God judged him guilty. That's the same Isaiah 53, the same passage of scripture. It pleased God to bruise him. 
It wasn't the Romans. I can hear Philip now. You heard about Jesus of Nazareth that the Romans crucified? It wasn't the Romans crucified him. It wasn't the Jews that crucified him. <laughs> it was God Almighty that crucified him. It was God the Father that purposed the death of his own son. It was God Almighty that took the sword of his own justice and sheathed it into the heart of his own son. When he saw the sins of his people on him, he put him to death. And it, and it was the Lord Jesus Christ who opened not his mouth, who went as a lamb to the slaughter. Why didn't he open his mouth? Because he owned the sins of his people as his own. He said, my sins have gone over me. They are more numerous than the numbers of the hairs of my head. He cried in Psalm 38. He said, I will be sorry for my sins. And so the Lord Jesus Christ opens not his mouth in, in, in rejection or in in defense of himself because he willingly bore the sins of his people and suffered the wrath of God's justice in order to put those sins away once and for all, all by himself. And he accomplished the work of redemption. He opened not his mouth and went to a lamb, went as a lamb to the slaughter because he was guilty. He was guilty of our sins. He bore the shame and the guilt, the sorrow for sin. He opened not his mouth because he, he laid down his life for his sheep. No man took it from him. He willingly laid it down in order to meet the requirements of God's justice, that all the hindrances that religion, the Ethiopian religion and the, and the Judaism religion that would put in the way of a, of a eunuch, a eunuch, a person who has no ability in and of themselves to produce any life could be saved, would be saved. So that the eunuch said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Is there anything? You, you just preached to me the gospel of God's free and sovereign grace and the accomplished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. What else is there that needs to be done? Is there anything else? Philip said, nope. It's all done. You believe? You believe? I don't make a work out of faith. Every time we talk about believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, I feel a need to say this because in the religious world, faith is your contribution. It was Philip saying to this Ethiopian, if you bring your faith, then that'll be the, that'll be the thing that'll tip the scales. That'll be the thing that God requires you to do. Faith by its very nature is the absence of all work. It's the absence of all ability. It's the absence of all, Lord, I, I, I don't have anything. I don't have anything to contribute. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Is that not what the Ethiopian said? I believe that Jesus you just preached to me from Isaiah 53 is the only hope that I have of being saved. I believe that God is satisfied with him. I believe that God raised him from the dead as the proof that God was satisfied with him. We know that Philip must have talked to him about baptism. How would if he had known anything about baptism? And here they are in a desert land, and in God's providence, they come up on this little oasis. I can just see it. A few palm trees, a little pond of water, maybe some camels, and drinking. And, and, the, and the Ethiopian says, there's water. 
What doth hinder me to be baptized? Can I, can I follow Christ? Can I profess Christ? And Philip said, if thou believest. If you believe that Christ is all, if you believe on him and in him as all of your salvation, <laughs> that you've got nothing to add to what he has already done, that's the only hindrance. That's the only hindrance to being baptized, unbelief. I mean, to, yeah, to being baptized, to professing Christ, to be the only hindrance. What doth hinder me if thou believest? If you are resting all of your hope on the Lord Jesus Christ for all of your salvation, you will know that it was God that brought you to that place. Just like God in his prevenient grace took this man all the way from Ethiopia, gave him all the privileges that he had in his life, made him a eunuch, brought a... a, a, a gospel preacher to him in Gaza <laughs> in the bondage and stronghold of his own sin in a desert place it was God that made him to differ Lord I've got no place else to go that's what this Ethiopian was saying what you just preached to me has shut me up to Christ I can't add anything to what he's done. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one sent of God to accomplish the salvation of God's people and all my hope is in him. All my hope is in him. <laughs> Philip said, stop the chariot. All the hindrances have been done away. This man wants to profess faith in Christ. Baptism is such a simple, simple message, as is the gospel. Ryan and Lord Grace in a few minutes are going to be plunged under the water. Buried with Christ. Christ's death is my death. What Christ did on Calvary's cross, the only hope I have that my sins have been put away, that they've been separated from me as far as the east is from the west, I can't do anything about them. When Christ raised from the dead, I raised from the dead. Christ is my life. He's my life. He's my righteousness. He's my justification. He's all my salvation. Very simple. Christ is everything. I'm nothing. He gets all the glory. Amen? All the glory. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the faith that you give by your word and by your spirit to rest all our hope in Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Number 29 in the spiral hymnal. Let's stand together.
rich in mercy, would not let me die in sin. Hallelujah, God has saved me, saved me by his sovereign grace. Jesus died, the Spirit called me, I am saved by sovereign grace. Chosen by my heavenly Father and redeemed by Jesus' blood, I am justified, forgiven, and accepted by my God. Hallelujah, God has saved me, saved me by his sovereign grace. Jesus died, the Spirit called me, I am saved by sovereign grace. God the Spirit came in power, gave me life and set me free. He revealed my blessed Savior and created faith in me. Hallelujah, God has saved me, saved me by His sovereign grace. Jesus died, the Spirit called me, I am saved by sovereign grace. God has saved me and will keep me by the power of His grace. He will guide, guard, and protect me till I see my Savior's face. Hallelujah, God has saved me, saved me by his sovereign grace. Jesus died, the Spirit called me, I am saved by sovereign grace. Please be seated. Let's sing hymn number 190 now. We usually sing this for baptism. It's a good hymn. Number 190 from the hardback hymnal. <clears throat> That's a different hymn, Joy. 190 in the hardback. We bless the name of Christ the Lord. We bless him for his. We'll just sing it a cappella, okay? Let's see if we can get the right, the first note right. We bless the name of Christ the Lord. We bless him for his. Holy Word, who loved to do his Father's will, and all 